This is a podcast for Taint, Taint, Taint magazine. My name is Josephine Ishman, and today we're here with Victor Ahikamenor. Victor is a Nigerian American artist, photographer, and writer. His works are described as abstract, symbolic, politically, and historically motivated. Victor was the 2020 National Artist in Residence at the Neon Museum in Las Vegas and was a 2016 Rockefeller Bellagio Fellow. His writing has been uh, published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the BBC, and CNN. Victor is also founder of Angel and Muses, an organization dedicated to the promotion and development of contemporary art and literature in Nigeria. Welcome, Victor. So nice to have you here. Thank you, Josephine. It's a pleasure. You know, thanks for having me. You know. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about where you're from in Nigeria and how you began painting? Uh, I'm from Esan, which is part of the Edo Kingdom, uh, the old Beni Kingdom in, in Nigeria, which is in the Midwestern part of the country. Um, you know, grew up uh, amidst art, you know, all forms of art. Um, think of, you know, carving, bronze casting, um, you know, performance art, storytelling, um, you know, all kinds of festival and, and fiesta that you can think of that would be considered today as really, um, that can be categorized now in a way because, I mean, back then it's not categorized, it's just it's just a way of life, you know. So there is the blacksmith's household, that is the bronze casters uh, zone, these are the wood covers, these are the ones that create the masquerades, these are the dancers, you know. So every age grade we have what they contribute and they grow into something else. There's a rite of passage um, in that sense of the word. So uh, when you look at that robust um, situation, as a precocious child, I, I was always just picking up a lot of these things. There were drawings on the wall, Our the vernacular architecture was you know, really beautiful, like anything that is art related, I wouldn't walk past it, which was, which was really weird. By the time I could handle a chalk and a slate, I was already drawing, I was drawing on sand, drawing on walls. Uh, my mom's walls were covered, which wasn't fun for her because she has to keep repainting them. And, yes. you know, so when I entered school, I just, I just never stopped. I've never really stopped since then. You know? So, um, you know, I'm glad now that I can do it uh, in a more professional way um, and, and actually like be the artist that I've always wanted to be. Wow, that's wonderful. It sounds so organic, like such a natural process. You were surrounded by all this beauty and then it just continued with you. Uh, how did you make the sort of transition from drawing on your, the walls and your, your mother's walls to actually curating work to be you know, seen by the public? Um, in a nutshell, so at every given time, I will find something that is art related to do. Uh, when I was in primary school, uh, I entered primary school at primary school is like your, I don't know, KG or I don't know what it's called. I can't remember what it's called in the US, you know, so preschool, you know, or something like that, yes, at the age of five, yes. you know, so, um, I would draw on my, on my slates because they'll give you a piece of slate that you can use chalk on. That's how you start then before you graduate to notebooks. So I'll draw on, you know, like just ceaselessly be drawing with chalks on my, on my, on my, on my, dark, on my, on my plate. From there then to two, three, four, five, six, primary six. By then I was drawing on the, on the remaining sleeves of, of, of my notebooks and my textbooks. I'll just draw on them with different kinds of things. They'll buy like a, a notepad or drawing book as we call it back then. I finished mine before, like within a day or two, I would have drawn on all of them. And it's supposed to last you an entire term, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're really having a good time enjoying so, yourself. Yeah, I was yes. just like going at it then. I would now, you know, like, so you have what you call uh, like calendar. So, in the village, there was this culture of calendar, like people would bring calendar and almanac. So some of them are plain on the back. It's only, so you have 12, 12 months, 
and it's not printed on the back. So the old one, the year before, because it's useless to uh, my dad, you know, or my mom and stuff like that. So I just take them and start drawing on them. So got to uh, secondary school. I continue with that on my notebooks and my, I, I was doing other things and I really wanted to like have an art teacher, but we didn't have an art teacher in my, in my high school at all, you know. So, and I couldn't go to, I couldn't do it in my, my finance and all of those things and I, I was unable to uh, now go to a higher institution to study art like I really wanted to. So I then opted for English and literature uh, in my first degree. So in getting to school, I the first thing I did was to make to make sure I, I, I joined all the campus magazine so I could be the cartoonist for them and also write as well okay. and design the covers for them and all of that so at every given point I was always like finding ways to like uh, express my visual creativity uh, in that sense of the world you know and um, yeah by the time I graduated there still was no art school for me to go to or I didn't so I now became that's where the writing part really like started and the poetry the fiction the non-fiction mm -hmm. um kicked in you know and um two years or three years after I graduated then I left I left Nigeria went to London first I didn't do much art in London you know it was just writing while I was there for a year plus it was when I moved to America that I now reignite my 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 you know my paintings and my drawings uh, when I visited uh, the Smithsonian National Museum for African Art you know so I was lucky to have been introduced to uh, an older African-American artist who has visited Nigeria several times, you know, he, he's, it was like his 60 then, Bernard Brooks, who studied at Howard University. I was really uh, entrenched in the whole African artist, Nigerian, Senegal, Senegal, um, he's been to Senegal, he's been to, he's traveled to Egypt and all over, you know, just like experiencing the whole continent and uh, referencing the art, you know, so a lady introduced me to him and he just took me under his wings and became my mentor wow. uh, for the longest time. So he reintroduced me to the Nigerian art that I didn't even know about because, I mean, oh. if I didn't go to university to study art, I didn't know the academic side of it. I didn't know who the, the artist, the, the really big time artist before me were, whereas I could hold my ground. Uh, in literary conversations, but not necessarily in the art, you know, so I didn't know who were, who was Uchi Okeke, who was Obiora de Chuku, all these, all these guys, you know, that were really like henchmen, who was Bruce on a black wire. Uh, these are really big time artists that, that have been in the uh, system uh, for the longest time that I would have known if I went to a university or if I went to a polytechnic to study art in Nigeria. So he reintroduced me to all of their arts. And I was just really enamored by them, you know. I when I when he took me to Smithsonian to see the first show that I ever saw in America called the Poetics of Lines. It was by seven Usuka school artists. Usuka is the is, is eastern part of the country where you have University of Nigeria that has a very strong uh, art program, both visual and art history program, very strong, you know. So I just keyed back in. I realized that what these people have done, I have been doing without knowing what I was doing, really. So right. they put it in perspective for me. This, this group of artists put it in perspective for me because one of the most senior of those artists we are, that were shown is uh, Uchi Okeke, who believed in natural sentences that art, you should go back to where you are coming from and let art come out from you, which, which has always been my, my, my case, you know. Oh, that's so, so interesting. Uh, yeah, so I started drawing, painting, you know, then started working for National Geographic. I did other things, you know, worked in IT. When I was in National Geographic, I was, I was, um, I was in the information technology department with them. You had a day years. job at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I had a day job. <laughs> you know, yes. I've, 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 to a very large extent, I've always had a day job. You know, American will make you pay your bills, whether you like of it or not. Of course. Yes. Uh, and also the art boom, if we call it that, of the black um, artists that we are seeing today was not always there. I mean, I, I, I don't hesitate to tell people that the doors were locked uh, pretty much and very few were allowed into the 
you know, into the museums, into galleries and all yep. of that. It just was not a place for a lot of artists that, that are being celebrated today, you know. Mm. Um, so, and it was even worse for, for those of us that are, you know, blacks yet immigrants in America, you know. So it was, was quite tough, you know, um, in, that, in that. So I had to do other things to make ends meet, um, you know, up until 2008 when I returned to Nigeria to take up a job as a creative director for a new, a new media house newspaper. Um, then that was when I really like reconnected with Nigeria. By now I was already an artist. By now I was already like making artworks and, and all of that, you know. So it helped me to reconnect with Nigeria heavily and to now really like being entrenched in the in the art movements and what is going on, met other artists of my age, met the older ones. Like, you know, by now I've, I've had a lot of knowledge about Nigerian art and bought a lot of books, a lot of uh, monographs that I've read, consumed. So in that sense, whereas I don't like using the word self-taught, my art history is self-taught, you know, to, yes. to, to teach myself about right. these great guys that have that I've um, that I've done the heavy lifting before my arrival into the scene, you know, mm -hmm. and um, up to the extent of um, you know about five, I would say about five five years, six years ago when I started looking at exactly where am I coming from, you know, not that I don't know where I'm coming from, but I want to like critically look at it now, you know. Mm -hmm. So which brought me to like, okay, I'm coming from an empire, a kingdom that that yeah. that that knows art in and out it was it was our daily living i just realized oh i've lived this life of art ever forever you know there was no time i've never been entrenched in art while i was in nigeria while i was at home i come from a, a, a kingdom that any well-meaning museum in the west we have a piece that my grand my great 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 grandparents made okay mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother was a cloth weaver uh, my grand, my paternal, my maternal grandfather uh, was a blacksmith. My mother had things that that he made for her. I, you know, like so. I just okay. So I embraced it. It's not like I ever distanced myself from it. I embraced it and began to look at the injustices that were also there up until really familiarizing myself that okay. So how did this some of this really old work get out of my kingdom? Then began to read about the Benin massacre which is with the british called punitive expedition for like for for them to like kind of sweeten it like punitive expedition okay fine what did did Benin do for you to come and punish them who who gave you the right to even come and punish another kingdom why you understand you are not invited and all of that so the word punitive expedition is even it's an aberration in the first in the first case. That is how all the history book reports it: punitive expedition. So when you are a white kid or you are a black kid and you read that, like, oh, Benin did something crazy. That is why the British came to punish them. No, it was a massacre. Right. Yeah. Okay, exactly. So yes. And I'm, a, and I'm so glad yeah. that you're um, talking about that in yeah. some of your essay writing now. Um, yeah. But before we get so, to that, I'm going to yeah. share my screen so our viewers get a chance to see. Uh, some of the incredible work that you're doing and I'm I'm glad that it's now being celebrated it sounds like all over the world um, okay can you um, talk about a little bit about what we're seeing here uh, so this is from a series uh, this one is called Cardinal Deswa uh, this is from my female Cardinal series because I mean I, I operate on this duality of uh, um, you know, Edo cosmology meets the Catholicism because I grew up a Catholic. I was born and raised a Catholic, but with a lot of Catholic tradition, I went to Catholic schools and stuff like that. But I also grew up in a traditional home. Um, so in my art, you are going, you are bound to find that that duality, which is not very, which is not a strange thing for us. We we have the ability as 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 uh, Edo people or even Nigerians to be able to ride. Uh, that two lines like okay so we understand this culture we understand where you are coming from but we also like hope that you can see where we are coming from and see this is how two of them can mix which uh, colonials didn't quite buy into they just wanted to like superimpose their own thing on us and and make us forget where we are coming from uh, you know so when you look at you know 
uh, indirect rule and direct rule, you know, which are the two different ones. The Francophone countries have a different experience from the Anglophone countries, you know. So, but mm -hmm. our own was like, you know, the Benins resisted, you understand? The Edo people resisted, like, look, we're going to hold on to our tradition as much as possible. So you're going to find this duality of, of culture and visual representation in a lot of other works that are done by Bini artists. So you're going to find it in, in works by somebody like Irabo Emokpae, who, who is late now, who was a strong Bini uh, artist. Uh, you're going to find it in uh, Bruce Onabrakpae, who is also, though not from Bini city, but he's from the part of the older kingdom, you know, he's from Urobo. And he references both uh, Christian and, and uh, the, the Edo tradition and, and the Urobo tradition, you know. So you're going to find a lot of the artists from that region, from my place, like we are riding that line of like, okay, here is Christianity, but this is also our tradition. So you are looking at, um, you know, like an African woman, a Bini woman, an Edo woman that is dressed like a, like a, like a cardinal. And, but when you take that one further a little bit politically, you realize what I was commenting on is that how come there are no uh, female priests that are, Ah, I see. That are ordained in Catholicism, yes. you understand, yeah. you know. So Africa has like one billion or so. I don't know the numbers. Can't remember the numbers now. But how come women are not ordained, you know? So right. let's speak to that uh, in some of the work. So I, I have a series that are just like female cardinals, you know. I have wow. male cardinals. The male cardinals is like, how come we only have two cardinals? that can vote when the Pope is needed that are Africans, only two. And they have 222 in the Vatican, right? Mm -hmm. So where lays our power? You know, when you have only two people that can contribute to a vote out of 222, then right. we, we don't stand a chance, you know? So yet we are like, okay, we are helping to coronate the Pope, whereas, you know, we really don't have a political uh, number or the, or the, uh, the quorum to even really like say, okay, we are part of this. So if you cannot coronate, if you cannot, if you don't have the number to coronate, do we really belong? You understand? Because yes, so. yes, absolutely. And what about this? Uh, these are part of uh, my sculpted canvas. I think this is called, uh, it's rainy and the sun is shining, which is something that uh -huh. is sometimes <laughs> in Benin tradition, when you see the rain, falling and the sun is shining at the same time like it's a clear sky there is a sun and the rain is also falling and all of that it is believed that an elephant is giving birth wow so that okay yeah. so which means it's a huge thing that is happening yes something, something marvelous is happening in the country um in somewhere in the in the in the in the hemisphere you understand you know so um i visualize some of our, our tradition in a in a different way not like direct um, not like just direct interpretation of stories or history or or what we believe in, but you know find ways to to get into those things. So I think this that is that is what this piece represents. This is like twenty. So beautiful. 20, yeah. And this looks like some of your photography. This is... Yes, this is a photography part whereby I mix all uh, my drawing, my paintings, my photography, my installation, all in one uh, piece. You know? okay. So what the, what the um, model is wearing is, is a canvas that is painted, like a sculpted canvas that she wraps around herself. Then that wall is my old studio wall that I used chalk to, to draw on, and then I painted on her. So everything blends into everything, like, um, you know, so when, when grandmas are telling us stories when we're kids, the, the way they move stories from the other world to the present world, the present, past, future, is very seamless, you understand? Seamless and colorful, you, you don't even know how you have been carried from one realm to the other, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this uh, series is, that is what this series represents. I see. Oh, and this I found so interesting. This is a perforated piece, correct? Yeah, yes, this is perforation, um, I mean, Perforation, scarification, along that whole line, you know, started this series a um, few years back now, you know, um, they are done on, on handmade paper and they are all hand perforated nails. So wow. nails is nails is, is hand perforated and, um, and it's quite labor intensive. But when you look yes. at some of them, I, you look at some really old 
pictures of different part of uh, Africa continent realized that there was a lot of body scarification that were beautification, you know, so right. uh, some of them were for healing processes, others were just for identification. And, um, you know, so we don't have art for art's sake in the back in the days, everything that was art related has a meaning, not just for aesthetics. So if you see a body scarification is to beautify, but to also identify. Wow. If you see a okay. body scarification, it's mm -hmm. because uh, a certain procedure has been done for, for medication or herbs to be applied. But instead of just having like marks that are not creative, they will actually like create uh, things on your body and then apply the herbs so that when it heals, we don't have a plastic surgeon to clear it. So how do you carry scars yes. that are beautiful? So these are wow. beautiful scars that we carry. Oh my goodness, that's so interesting. Uh, and you're also doing sculpture. Yeah, this is a bronze, uh, this is a bronze piece. So I go back to Benin City a lot, which is like um, really knee deep in bronze casting, which is where all these bronzes from most of the museums that you see are coming from. You know, I go there to work with the elders and the people that are still practicing it. So I create the molding, then I leave it with them, then they cast it the way they were casting it centuries back, you know. so. These are very meaningful and very uh, um, important to me in the sense that it's a tradition that I want to continue uh, no matter what, even in a more contemporary way, to just let the world know that we have a way of continuity in my, in my community. Yes. And this is these a drawing? Are, these are drawings, these are charcoal drawings. You know? So I mean, this one was done this year um this was done this year this is uh it was it's part of a series when i arrived america in october so these are called noir nervousness noir nervousness is just that black nervousness black lives matter black black male uh, extinction in america i <laughs> love it maybe that's why i identified <laughs> with this one i saw it immediately was, oh my yeah, i love this so, yeah so that is what this is so the entire series of this particular piece which uh, uh, I sent to um, Prof first were just these ones. Like these were the first works that I created when I arrived. Stunning. Yeah. Uh, this is new. So this is actually like you really speaking to what I was, um, what has happened and what was yet to happen. So this, this title of this space is called Blue State, Red State, Black State, ETC. I mean, speaking to the whole uh, political upheaval that is happening in America when I, so again, this was, this is being shown right now at the Neo Museum in Las Vegas, right? Yes. <clears throat> Which was my last residency that I just finished uh, mid, um, um, last part, last, uh, last days of December, you know, right before Christmas, you know. Uh, I arrived. I arrived right before the elections. You know, so there was so much tension. There was voter suppression. I was in Maryland. I landed in Maryland. And driving on the Beltway, I just realized that a lot of people were driving these huge trucks. Um, you know, like just like flying flags, flying Trump flags, flying Confederate flags, uh, flying all types of flags that one could not even recognize. You know, so and I, there was just really this trigger you know again yep. like we were saying earlier if you read history and if you read history you watch movies and everything this is not far-fetched from the 50s when ku klux klan would ride horses just to ride through black neighborhoods yes. even and intimidate the, even, people yeah, yes yeah, yeah. Right. just like mm -hmm. intimidate them so that like okay oh, you know what we are here we are here yes we own this place we are not going to do havoc today we're not going to have up. We're going to, we're just going to like frighten you guys out of your skin. Right. Then they ride through the neighborhood in their big horses. And, you know, so now we don't ride horses in America anymore. We ride trucks, right? Okay. So I don't want to mention truck. Uh, <laughs> I don't want <laughs> okay. to mention truck brands, you know, so, but right. we know that they buy yeah. these trucks, they put big flags on the back of it and ride it through these neighborhoods. It was in PG County, which is predominantly black neighborhood in Maryland, you know, so, I, 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 so I spent two weeks there, you know, cast my vote before I left for Vegas. When I got there, I, 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 
I realized I have to make this piece. So this is the first piece that I made. Is the Africa? Is the American flag? What is American flag? What is my flag? Okay, if you are saying red state, what is red state? Does that necessarily mean okay? Red state means this is predominantly white people. If you say blue state, is it predominantly uh, uh, black and brown people because mm -hmm. we tend to belong to Democrats? You know so. Let's look at colors, okay? American is not colorblind, all right? right? So everything is color coded, okay? So how do we talk about colors in America? As an artist, how do I talk about colors? Let's even move colors to aesthetics now, okay? We used to have the red lines. What did the red line mean? Okay, so fine, we no longer have red lines now, but those red lines are there, they are hard coded. You may not see them, but red lines all over in America. Okay, fine, I can't buy a house in certain neighborhood, you can't buy a house in certain yep. neighborhood, you can't have a drink in certain neighborhood, but yet there is nothing on the door that says whites only or blacks only, but these things are ingrained in the system, right? It's alive okay. and well, yes, not with just um, so, residences, schools, everything. Yeah. It's, it's um, So yeah. you take your kid to another, school district they're like ah no you can't you know so no. i mean what have we achieved over these years and all of that you know so this piece for me is just like look man we pay allegiance to this flag that we don't even know if it's a unifying flag right. so everybody have their private flags that they fly Isn't some of times yes. they bring it out sometimes they hide it okay so that is this piece wonderful and how about this? So these are made from prayer rosaries. So we go back to Catholicism again, you know, so everything you are seeing there is a prayer rosary, like, um, like I don't know if you, if you know what a rosary is, Catholic yes. rosary that, that you, so everything you see there is prayer rosary. So I just use it to represent my people, you know, like, you know, create, um, you know, create a situation whereby, you know, like, if we use it for, if we use this totem, because somebody immediately told me that my small bronze statuettes were fetish. Um, I'm like, this is what uh, I created them myself. So how do you empower certain totems and downgrade certain totems? Okay, so growing up, when I hold a, a rosary, I feel empowered. I feel nothing can harm me, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so my great-grandfathers and mothers that didn't have a Christianity as at that time, they had things that they believed in as well okay so this could be amulets and all of that you know so but when you see my own you don't know that what you are telling me is that yours is better than mine that i should forget my ancestors right because the rosary and the head of the rosary is the crucifixion of christ okay christ is our ancestors is your ancestor but let me also like we have an ancestor right okay fine yes. So how do we commemorate them? How do we remember our ancestors? Because what the colonialism did to us is like, you do not have a past. We right. will make sure that we wipe away your past and we start your history from where we came here. Yes. Okay? So that is why Mongo Park can come to Nigeria and say he discovered River Niger, as if he just suddenly woke up and River Niger just suddenly appeared, okay? So at every given time, we have to be able to unpack some of these things and begin to see the hidden messages and how uh, oppression is being perpetrated in different ways, you know. So um, after that encounter with the Italian woman that thought that my works were fetish because I, did, with the whole bronze that I created myself, making works from them, so I said, okay, if I use the rosary that you introduced to me that is still being re uh, reverenced in the Vatican, if I use it to make artworks that you can clearly say, this is an African artist making this work, this is a Nigerian artist making this work, and he is referencing his people, will it still be fetish? What makes mm. it fetish? Is it me, the artist that has made the work, or what you don't recognize? If I create something that you can recognize, will it still be fetish? Wow. So. Okay. That is when I started using uh, those things, you know. Okay. Uh, this was in Senegal, 2016. Um, it's called the prayer room. I just created an entire room to reference where elders will meet and pray. Like it could be a church, could be a shrine, could be anything, but it's a place where you can enter and become a remain calm. You know, that mm. is this piece. The finished one should be, there should be a finished one. Oh, yes. This. Yes. So this is the finished one of it. So yeah, this was in the Adidas Cabinale in 2016. 
Okay, and when you take down the installation, what happens to the artwork? Are you just store it in your studio for another one? Or? Yeah, some of okay. the artwork. So, so, so this is kind of ephemera in the sense that okay, fine. It has this one has its own history because so the 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 canvases that are sculpted canvases that you see, they are yes. they are back they are back with me, you know. So uh, in Nigeria, or some of them have been collected, you know, but. Um, as far as the the building is concerned, once you live there, another year or two, it happens every two years. Another artist can be assigned the space and decide to do something that with it. But I realized in twenty, I did it in twenty sixteen, twenty eighteen. They did not assign the place; they left it as it was. And people that came back to the to that version of the Biennale were able to see the installation. They sent me pictures and stuff. I was like, okay, cool. That is the first time I'm seeing an artwork that spanned two biennales, you know, so okay. it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is just, uh, my daughter loved this, by the way. <laughs> neon, neon is very big uh, in American <laughs> pop culture right now. So she just yeah. like, mom, I want this for my room. <laughs> <laughs> If it's she has stunning. enough space to, I know that's what a, I said. I'm sure she has it's enough huge. space for a 300 pounds walk. You know that would oh be cool. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> She'd be the coolest person in New York. I have to tell you. <laughs> so how did you yeah. create this? Um, so when I when I when I got the residency to be the 2020 National Artist in Residence in um, at the New York Museum, I, I knew that I was going to like try my hands on making neon works, but how do I translate my, my drawings and my iconography to a neon piece was a bit of a challenge to me. But when I got to the residency, I realized that they actually have the resources, the people that can do it, um, and which I was very excited about. So when I met the, the neon guy, who his name is Oscar, is from Mexico and he's been bending neon for the longest time. We just connected. We really, really connected. And I showed him my work and showed him my drawings. He was super excited about it. So I went and create a special drawing that he can now bend and all of those things. So I'll come, I'll go back to his studio, I'll go back to where it's made every every three days or four days or there about just to check on it and um, you know did a little bit of the bending and everything. So he was following my lines and my drawing. So there's a drawing of this that was made that he followed very meticulously with all the colors that I signified in the drawing. You know, so um, so this is my first new piece. It's called Harvesting Dreams and Fireflies with My Brother. So it kind of takes me back to the village where whatever we dream of, we, we are able to like create, you understand, you know? So all we have to do is to find the right team members, the right team playmates to to create stuff and amazing things you know so um i'm quite pleased with this piece um it's still yes. it's still it's still in the exhibition right now and um it's, it's um, i like it you should be it's it's just stunning Thank you. um we have a few minutes left and i just want to go back to our conversation about um reclaiming the works from nigeria and yeah. When you talk about this, I just want, oh, actually we have one more here. Let me just, let's talk uh, about this first and then, yes. Uh, this is about extraction in Nigeria. This is about oil. This is about, um, uh, it's, the title of this is Wealth of Nation Ogoni 9. This was done in Dresden in 2016. Then it showed in another exhibition in Poland in, um, I think, 2017. Okay, so this was the one that was shown in Dresden in um, in um, in Germany, you know. Uh, just to make a conversation about, so Godinai uh, Kensaro Wewa, who was an environmentalist and also a writer, was uh, was assassinated, uh, was, was um, what is the word I'm looking for? Was hung, right, by the, by the then uh, mm. detector Sani Abacha, because he was calling out Shell Petroleum uh, in Nigeria and the environmental disregard for, for the environment of where he's coming from, which is the Ogoni land, where you have a lot of environmental pollution, even up until as we speak right now, there is still a lot of environmental pollution due to oil yes. uh, exploration in the area. You know, So because he was really like calling foreign attention to what was happening to his homeland, farmers couldn't farm anymore, uh, fishermen, the rivers were all polluted and nothing, the ecosystem was just completely destroyed, you know. So he, 
he with some other people and the Ogoni people were calling for justice and calling for uh, for the for the water for the water the land and everything to be cleaned. But the government of the day felt that they were they were obstructing where the single uh, uh, the single source of income for Nigeria. You know, if you ask me, you know, which is the oil. Thing. And so they rounded them up, and uh, he was uh, he was executed, you know. So, and uh, his body was dissolved in an acid, you know. So oh in goodness. acid, you know. So it was really a horrendous thing, and everything. And that thing mm -hmm. has never. This was November tenth, um, nineteen ninety five. I was in London when the news came, and I read his books. I'm, I'm a big fan of his writing and everything. And uh, my all my handles come from that, from one of his books, which is Soza Boy. So if you check my my handles and a lot of people know me my nickname is even soza boy based on one of his characters so okay. it was really close home for me and i was really bitter about it and it was the first time i was able to make a walk in commemoration of him and also to make a statement about how uh, nine of them were executed so these are the drums that are dangling as if they are hanging from a noose from the ceiling you know wow. so this was uh, done uh, in dresden in, in, in 20, 2016 yeah early 2016. that's very impressive i'm i'm just so um overwhelmed really how you're able to incorporate you know people have done so much and the and you know the fight for social justice and environmental justice and incorporate that into your work in such a in a resting way and it's such a beautiful way even though this piece is you know obviously has a very dark history it's yes. such a gorgeous piece so um it's you know, a lot of people will be attracted to it, I guess is my point. And then we'll go back and read about the history, which is, yeah, is, is just as important. Um, yeah. So the Queen Mother, um, this is a pendant that it is, yeah. well, you, you can tell us the history about us, but I just want the viewers to see this gorgeous piece while you talk about um, how important it is to get Nigerian art back to Nigeria and how it got out of Nigeria in the first place. I mean, it's, it's well documented uh, historically and lately it has been in the forefront of um, agitations and, and stuff. So this is one of the most important pieces that left the kingdom when the British attacked the Benin kingdom in uh, 1897, you know. Um, this particular piece uh, was commissioned by Obai Sige, who is one of the Obas in the 16th century, you know, so 15 something, I can, can, I don't know the actual year now. I can't remember the actual year when this was created. Um, it's a commemoration for his mother, who really helped him during turbulent times during his regime, uh, during his era as the Oba. So it was commissioned, the pendant was commissioned that every time he goes to war, every time he comes out during ceremony, he will wear it around uh, his waist to, to, to remember his mother, to say thank you for what the mother did for, for him and all of that. You know, fast forward to uh, three centuries later, 18, yeah, like, yeah, about, yeah, about two, or, yeah, about two centuries later, the British stormed the palace and they stole everything, you know. So there are five of them different, you know, made at different time. But these are the very original ones, you know. So you have this one in the, I think this is the one that is at the Met. I can't yes. remember. Okay, so this is the one at the Met. There you have one at the British Museum. You have one at Seattle Museum. You have one. Uh, in Europe, two I think are in Europe. There are five of them across the uh, across the world. You know? So, um, in in seventy five, when Nigerian was pl planning for the um, the Black uh, Arts Arts uh, and, and Arts and Culture Festival, which is known as the First Act Seventy, yeah, eventually happened in seventy seven, but it was planned to happen seventy five, uh, but due to you know, change of, of government and all of that, it got pushed to happen in 77. Um, you know, Nigeria requested for Britain to, lo to, to give them, you understand, this piece because it was the emblem and the symbol for, for the whole first act 77 and they refused, you know. So, and um, all they said that Nigeria should insure it for two million pounds as at then. I don't know what that is in, in today's uh, value. So, they refused. They, they commissioned another one, another artist to create a newer one for Nigerian government. You know, so Britain has always held on to what they didn't own, what they don't have, what was stolen from Nigeria, what was stolen from Benin Kingdom, 
in that sense of the word. So now that the whole uh, restitution uh, conversation has resurfaced again, and which is not going to go anywhere because this is not the first time it's coming up. And, you know, if the works are not restituted, it's not going to be the last time it's going to come up, you know. So anyway, so that is this particular piece that, um, that people have just uh, seen. Uh, again, there are five. There are five of them, but the one in Britain at the British Museum and the one at the Met are really like uh, two of the most gorgeous things you can ever lay your eyes on. Yes, they certainly are, and yeah. you know, it it just makes you look at art, everything in the museum in a whole different light. And of course, yeah. in the museums, they never talk about how the art was ever acquired. No, and, nobody, you know, if they I mean, did, nobody, nobody, nobody yeah. would go probably, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see people walking through and looking yeah. at these artworks and you wonder how much do people really know about this. So I'm so glad yeah. that you're highlighting this um, yeah. in your in your essay work. Um, yeah. I just want to touch for a minute on your on your fiction. Are you still writing fiction or um, and to really to know what the um, different process is, because you're obviously so multi talented in so many so many different areas. So how is it different creating um, a work of fiction as opposed to a painting? Ah, they, well, they are nearly the same, but I mean, when you really? look at it, wow. well, almost, 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 I, I'll come, I will explain a little bit. I mean, they are coming from the same brain because when I'm writing fiction, I'm writing as if I'm painting because I feel like I have to make people see something, you understand, right? Then when I'm drawing, then I'm like, okay, am I making... I, I sentences right now, you understand, you know, so I have those in my head. So if it's just a single line, that could be a heku. If it's about three lines that I'm using the drawing, that is a short poem. Uh, if I go a little bit above that, that is like, like one of the paintings, one of the drawings in charcoal that you saw, that is a short story. But when we are going to like look at um, a piece like the Wealth of Nation, or going nine, that, that entire installation, that could be a biography, right? So things have expanded, there are multiple characters. So that is how I, I is, you know, subliminally like in my head, that is how I process things, you know? So I haven't written fiction in a little while now, you know? I mean, I have things that I have, half and half that are sitting down on my laptop that I keep saying that I'm gonna go back to working on a longer fiction that I've been working on for the past five years. And, but art has really like taken a grip uh, at, 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 you know, they can, it, every art form is very jealous and very, um, like, you know, it's like, I, I joke with this, like you are like a polygamist. How do you attend to this different? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so when you pay attention to art, fiction is like angry, like, yeah, you know, I'm right, not going to like, I'm not going to give you my time of day. And you're trying to like, write, but like, like, why am I so stifled right now? You know? So then when you decide to like stay longer with fiction, then you come back to art. Art is like, okay, no, I don't know you. Where are you coming from? You know, so, but, but it's, so art for me is a bit easier this day because I can get up and just like draw and paint all day. But I find that when I want to go back to writing these days, you know, like I have so many things to write about, like, okay, politics, you know, nation, culture, and all of those things, you know, so. I, I really need to like get back to writing. And I keep telling myself this, sometimes I would buy new notebooks and sharpen my pencil and <laughs> yes. ah, instead of writing that I'll be using it to draw and all of that. Yeah. But uh, I love writing. It's, it's very, it's extremely cerebral. It's very tasking because I mean, to, to paint pictures with words, it's not the most, it's not the easiest thing that one can, uh, and I really love writers that, that have been able to continue with that whole thing, even though I, 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 I went back to, to school to actually like study fiction in MFA fiction so that I can get back to writing. Even that, yes. art, art is just one of those things that I've got, which is how me and Prof have uh, encountered in some of the residences that like, yeah, I'm going to apply for this residence so I can write. I'll get there, I'll probably be able to write one or two stories, you know, so. But I'm falling in love heavily with uh, nonfiction these days. So I've, I've written, I've, I've consistently been writing nonfiction, um, you know, so which is, which is good. 
mm-hmm. um, um, you know, waiting for one to get published that has been accepted, you know, so which is good. So we'll see. I love how inspired you are and how much energy you have behind all of your work. So, you know, you say you get up and you can just paint every day. So you're you're not really one of these people who needs to get in the mood, so to speak. Like, you don't don't need to turn on music or every day, just wake up, (laughs) ready to go. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a way of life. I mean, like I grew up in the village. A farmer doesn't wait for inspiration before he goes to the farm. So he knows that. this is true. This is true. You know, like even when there is no rain, the farmer goes to the farm and pray for rain while walking and doing something that doesn't really need rain at that particular time. So that when the rain comes, you would have planted and the rain will have something to fall on, you know. So I have a lot of that village um sensibility to the way i even look at things and look at my work you know so because i mean i was i was raised there you know so the 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 discipline of work the the way you look at things that you have put your hand in you know it's it it's it's not it's not it's not a a habit that i really want to give up you know okay well we thank you so much for being here today it's been thank you so amazing much, talking to you and Thank I hope you, to see sure. your, your work in New York soon. I, you've got I, to New York and soon. bring these yeah. pieces here. <laughs> this would be a very big <laughs> hit. We are waiting for <laughs> this. So um, we'll Thank have to talk so more on that. <laughs> yes, definitely. But thank you. You have a wonderful you so day. Yes, and um, we'll be in touch soon.